um, uh, it comes from a Greek word, polis as the city. So, you know, during the descent in, in the communist times, mm-hmm. uh, the dissidents, uh, the, the smart people of the country that were persecuted by, by the system, they, one of them, uh, Václav Benda, he said, we need to create a parallel world if we can't live in the, in the current environment. And that's what Bitcoin does. So uh, there's a group of uh, artists in, in Prague who opened a, a space and we made it purely Bitcoin space. So you cannot pay with uh, euros or, or check coronas. Uh, you can only use crypto to pay for your coffee. And you know, there's a uh-huh. co-working space and, and on top of the building, it has several floors. There's the Institute of Crypto Anarchy, uh, where people come to learn about, you know, crypto stuff and, uh, and why it's important and stuff like that. So, yeah, you yeah. have to come. <laughs> if we try to visit. do this in India, like, the government is going to arrest us. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, 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 I know. India is kind of uh, uh, the becoming... Uh, an interesting place and I don't mean it in a very positive way so I'm sorry to hear no. all the, I've been you know I've been dealing uh, with uh, Indian customs a lot while I was uh, I, I mean not me personally but Trezor as a company has been dealing with that a lot because your government is obviously stealing uh, everything they can from you so you mm-hmm. import stuff and you pay 150 percent on top of that just you know so right. that's a clearly like a, a techniques of, of a mafia uh, to oh, extort oh. you know the citizens like that so yeah. I'm you know <laughs> I feel with you <laughs> I read about that all the time my LinkedIn is always full of uh, me bashing the Indian government or the or the American government because of taxes or corruption or whatever uh-huh. Are you still like free to talk or is it is that becoming also an issue? I mean so far like I was working with Google I have a I have a good profile so like I don't think anybody can come arrest me but I think if it's uh, you are bashing a politician directly so I, I always make sure I don't bash an individual I always bash an organization or like a system in general so yes, yes, as long as of you course. do that I think you are you're I mean, it's a democratic country after all, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's start. Let's start. Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the channel. Today, we have Alina with us. Alina is leading the strategy at Casa, and she was previously the CEO of Trezor. And she's also actually working on a new foundation known as the B Foundation. So in this interview, we'll try to understand like uh, what she is trying to do in the space, uh, how she sees the how she sees the current space gr- growing in the future, and uh, what what interesting projects that she's saying currently. So, Alina, first of all, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation to come on the call. Well, thank you very much for having me, guys. It's an honor. Awesome, awesome. So, like, uh, can you first for some of our audience who might not know you, uh, can you give a brief background of how you got into crypto and what sort of uh, what sort of okay. skills do you bring to the table? Okay, um, so I'm, a, you know, uh, I'm a business developer. Uh, I've been building successful businesses uh, since I left uh, my my university. So when I was about 22, 23, I started my career in insurance and risk management, uh, and spent 10 years uh, building stuff uh stopped there quite successfully and then you know i uh, after the crisis in 2008 i was thinking that i work in financial system but i don't really understand how money works and money and power together so i was you know i was really trying to understand and uh, decided to go and study geopolitics uh that was in 2010 uh and i was I got fascinated by the topic of money because I understood that's kind of the relationship, you know, uh, between what's going on in in the world uh, and the money seen as a tool to to, uh, manage people and to manage events. Uh, So uh, I was writing a thesis about international monetary system and why it's broken. And I was looking for better money. Uh, so I was digging into, you know, local currencies and stuff like that and found out about Bitcoin 
and then you know the story from there on it's the same for everyone who discovers bitcoin and then falls uh, um heads over heels or how do you call it the other way around and uh, basically since then uh, i'm i'm a i'm a big enthusiast uh, for bitcoin as a tool for freedom re-establishing a personal freedom and in 2013 um I had the chance and the opportunity to start Trezor with uh, Slash and Stick. So we uh, we started the project. Uh, uh, we took a year and a half to develop the first hardware wallet, and then we released it in 2014. And basically, last year I I left Trezor uh, because it was uh, it was proven as a successful story uh it's built up and for me as a business developer who likes to take uh, ideas from zero to profit then the work kind of like is fulfilled uh so i was looking for something to continue and uh me and my uh co-founders at satoshi labs we had different ideas of, of on where to go forward um so basically i uh said okay you finish what you need to finish on the Trezor T model, and I will continue finding a new path to develop basically applications that build on top of the security of a hardware wallet, and that's Casa. That's why I'm here. <laughs> okay, awesome. Before we like dig deep into Casa, I want to just like talk about the philosophy of the crypto space in general, right? So. So we all know the central banks that control all the money supply of all the countries, blah, blah, blah. Politics is pretty much controlled by them, right? And then there's this entire new alternate financial system that's popping up. And you can pretty much like buy services or sell your goods. You can hire developers and like all, all happening on a decentralized network. So, so my first question is, how do you see the space uh, uh, growing over the next few years and how do you think the adoption will kick in where there are like uh, not only millions but tens of millions hundreds of millions billions of people using the bitcoin network how do you say think that the entire space was, will unfold over the next few years or decades yeah i'm uh, i'm kind of very uh, positive and confident especially about the bitcoin space because uh, post SegWit, uh, uh, you know, there has been a lot of development happening, and I'm I'm quite excited about you know uh, the Lightning Network, the Liquid, and and all sorts of like privacy focused developments that are happening. Um, I think we will still do like a year or two of heavy building, uh, but uh, it, it's the time where we should uh, focus more on the user experience. And um, there are like different tendencies, you know, I'm, I am uh, a freedom lover and an anarchist, but I also understand that my mom, uh, if she sees like the Institute of Crypto Anarchy, she goes like, well, that's something very scary, right? Uh, and so this is how Bitcoin still feels to a lot of people. And I think this is like where we need to do a lot of the work uh, right now to, to make just, you know, Bitcoin work, for example, seamless in the background without people actually having to understand private keys, public keys, you know. So find ways how to make uh, things accessible. Um, yeah, this is wh where I feel it should go. Uh, don't ask me where it will go because I don't know. I I have some you know ideas uh, where this where this environment will go, but uh, who knows? You know things happen. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I think you started you started working with Trezor first. You were the CEO and the co-founder, and then you're working. You started working with Casa. So, like, how has that journey been? How was the journey be been with Trezor? Like, you were building, like, a hardware wallet. It's a wallet. Uh, so, it's a very high security uh, product. So, how was that experience, how, how was that experience like? Um, like, how, how did you actually get the users? How did you build the brand? I really want to know, like, how, how do you target that? The story of Trezor. Um, for me, Trezor was the first business outside of uh, services. So before, I, I always did financial services, right? Uh, risk management, insurance, uh, uh, all these kind of financial products. Uh, so 
Trezor was a combination of that of risk management that I, you know, had in my blood running before, uh, of uh, and of security, but also hardware. So that was kind of a very new thing for me, but also for my other two co-founders. None of us has ever built any hardware before. Uh, so that was kind of a learning process uh, where you feel like a baby and you don't know, uh, you know, oh my God, certifications, you know, and you're like discovering all this journey. So we, we totally lacked the, uh, the, the DNA for hardware, but we learned so much and I learned so much about building hardware in, uh, in the process that that was very valuable for me. And of course, I, thanks to my co-founders, I learned a lot about Bitcoin uh, and the technology. Right. That was um, the, the journey to to build uh, what is needed was it's kind of interesting because for me, that was a kind of, again, continuation of the, the risk management. Uh, and a treasure is kind of insurance. It's your one time insurance. You pay once and you secure your wealth. Right. Um, so it's kind of the same uh, same approach, uh, uh, just a different or. Same, same principle, but different approach. Uh, and uh, I realized, I understood that, you know, unless Bitcoin can be securely privately held, it won't succeed. Because then we, we introduce all these uh, layers in between, such as, you know, uh, custodian uh, wallets and exchanges, and we give away our inherent right to own money. Because Bitcoin was designed as private money, so you know that's a basic, very basic feature. So if we do not uh, uh, go along with that feature, uh, we will crash, and the user experience will be very bad. You know, so when people start losing money, they will probably not go back. The, you have a bad experience once, maybe you will get back, but not twice. Um, so Trezor laid the foundations there. It was kind of a also very different business for me to get into because before i was building businesses you know on on very uh, established very even over regulated space and now i was in in complete like very edge you know innovations uh that we approached um slightly differently than uh, than innovation is happening most of the days today so you have the silicon valley uh innovation hub right in the world and then you you're having now at least in the recent years chinese uh, uh supporting a lot of or at least investing i don't know if it's really happening in china uh and we took the the path of a uh, crowdfunding uh because we felt like this is something that uh that bitcoiners uh would uh, appreciate uh, and you know the involvement of individuals was very very important so we did a crowdfunding on purely on bitcoin that was fun uh, because when we started bitcoin was 90 dollars and by the time we were you know continued in the crowdfunding bitcoin hit 1000 and uh so <laughs> people went crazy over the fact that we didn't expect that at all you know for us it was actual complication it was a good one uh, but it was a complication because people kind of, you know, uh, were betting on the value. So they were trying to get uh, some bitcoins back. So the, the beginning was really like very uh, turbulent, very, very like, uh, um, uh, you know, like a roller coaster with the price of bitcoin. Um, so that was uh, that was the exciting part. We wanted to. We actually didn't want to create a company. Uh, at the beginning, the idea was just to do a proof of concept and send out 500 hardware wallets to the world and see, you know, and open source it so people can build their own. <laughs> that was basically the idea. And then we realized, like, wait, uh, there's actually a bigger demand and bigger need than we thought. We, because, at, you know, for me as a business developer, whenever I start the business, I know I have some data to work with. I know the size of the market. I know, you know, if you're working in insurance, you know how many people are insured, how many policies per person are there. So you kind of, you know, get a hint of like the market size and the potential. 
in Bitcoin, especially back in the days, you had like zero idea. <laughs> so we could look out of the window and say, maybe we will sell five. Maybe we will say sell 500, you know, so <laughs> you don't know. Um, uh, finally, we, we uh, you know, ended up uh, producing way more uh, because that was the condition of min minimum order from uh, the manufacturer. And um, it turned out to be very successful. So um, how you also asked how uh, I'm we were kind of getting customers. And I think uh, uh, a lot of the marketing for Trezor was word of, word of mouth. Uh, so people made experience and they shared and the crypto community is just connected. So it's easy to go on Reddit and or Bitcoin talk back in the days and post uh, reviews. And so that that's how it picked up like kind of naturally. And then uh, every price cycle influenced the sales of the hardware wallet big, big time. And I think Ledger can confirm the same. Uh, they came shortly after us. But you know, whenever you see a spiking uh, value of Bitcoin, people start to be more aware of the risk that they are exposed to. Uh, also, hackers get uh, more aware, uh, and uh, you know, criminals uh, uh, get more attention uh, to or put more attention into stealing. So you can see, uh, you you could basically take the price of Bitcoin and and put the amount of Bitcoin specific malware boomed at the same time as, as the price of Bitcoin, the amount of physical attacks and extortions and you know uh, kidnappings grow similarly to the Bitcoin price. So that's a kind of a good indicator of uh, the, the perceived need of security because the need is still the same, but you know, people are more aware when things happen. Right. Um, so, um, so I want to understand what was like some of the top challenges in building a product that has like an actual supply chain built into it, right? So it's a hardware product. You have to like uh, work with suppliers and like other people who are gonna like supply parts or, or manufacture that item for you, right? Um, really different from our traditional software model where you know you just have to like work on the releases and you're good to go. So, like, what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, working on an actual hardware product? So we, the, the first big lesson we learned already in the first months, uh, we promised to our uh, supporters back in 2013 to deliver Trezor, I think in October 2013. And we failed. Uh, we failed to de deliver on the promise because uh, there was a manufacturing problem. <laughs> you know, so we, again, because we didn't have uh, so much experience back in the days with, with hardware production, um, we didn't assume that there can be actually something going that wrong as it went. Uh, we had some issues with the uh, uh, with the molding and with with some like uh, production phase, and so we started to postpone. People people were getting very angry, of course. Uh, you know, whenever there's some some money in the game, uh, it's the that's the case. Uh, so that was, um, you know, to to understand the cycles, the production cycles of uh, hardware dependent on China, uh, because some components simply are just made in China, right? And if Chinese have uh, their New Year's, nothing is moving. And it's uh, not one month. Uh, it's like the, the time before because, you know, it's like when people are getting ready for a big vacation, they don't pick up new businesses, right? So, <laughs> so you need to kind of, yeah, yeah, like you need to uh, learn and understand these nuances uh, uh, connected with hardware production. That was kind of exciting. Um, also to, to learn um, things about traditional distribution uh, of, of products. Uh, understanding what, uh, how much of a, of your margin is cut away, you know, if you want to really go, if you want to sell uh, a hardware wallet in in a store, what it what it takes in between, you know, that was kind of an exciting for me to to learn, and then all the boring and and but important stuff such as. Uh, you know, uh, what it takes to do the actual logistics and taxation 
and uh, import export stuff uh, dealing with customs dealing with you know customs in india <laughs> for example um or argentina or russia like very difficult countries to to deal with you know the, where the governments uh, try to uh, suppress and control uh uh, their their inhabitants. That's when you, you see that clearly, even from outside, on um, on the massive import taxes and duties. You know, on how difficult they make it. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, you can confirm, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Indian government is not one of the some of the best governments in the world. Everyone knows that. <laughs> And, you know, this is why I think even like, uh, okay, I don't know how you guys getting your phones uh, to the country, uh, but I assume in the huge volumes, it's, it, it's easier uh, to import stuff. But that's why also the software uh, is the king in India. Right. It's yeah. Because you, ca you cannot stop it you and you cannot it. extort, yeah. you can't extort people for software because right. it's intangible. <laughs> Indian government has been pretty stingy about uh, ASIC miners as well. So you don't get ASIC miners in India easily. And if you all know the life of an ASIC miner is like five, six months. So you want to like get the machine, plug it in the day that you get it, right? But Indian government, the custom officials, they're so corrupt uh, that they already know this is an ASIC miner and the dude is going to lose money. So they're going to like uh, keep the thing in the customs for three months. They're going to extort money off of you and then they're, they're going to release it when the profitability is gone. So it literally yeah. makes zero sense to do ASIC mining in, mining in India. I tried, I, I lost some money and I was like, no man, I can't do it. <laughs> Got you. No, you better have like some uh, uh, investment uh, somewhere else. Right. You know, yeah. some, something sense. like that. <laughs> yep, yep. So uh, you, you worked with Treasure and then uh, recently you, in I think the Honey Badger conference, you announced uh, your involvement with Casa, uh, I, I don't know, uh, it, it was a sort of like a secret unveiling uh, that yes. <laughs> uh, Alina is working with Casa. So can you like talk about what sort of role you are playing there? And I, I just want to put it out there that we have bought one of your Casa Lightning nodes. I think we might be the first people Thank in you. India. Um, yeah, so. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Um, it was it was actually announced in uh, Palm Springs uh, at Crypto Springs, uh, a conference that was organized by uh, uh, Malcolm Demirs and uh, Elizabeth Stark and uh, Stacy Herbert uh, uh, from the Max Kaiser Report or yep, Kaiser yep. Report. Sorry. Right. Um, and uh, th so we, I've been working with Casa since like. Uh, uh, many months, but uh, we kept it uh, a little bit low um, for several, you know, strategic reasons, basically. But um, my, one of the first things uh, uh, to, for me to do, so I'm, I'm taking care, I'm developing the strategy of CASA, uh, the, the way how, uh, how this came all together was CASA was already uh, a, a, a team when I met Jeremy, uh, the CEO. Uh, they were already having a working uh, a version of, of uh, a multi-sig application that was building on top of hardware wallets. Okay, so you have com you as user have complete uh, uh, ownership because you own four or five keys. Um, so that was like uh, already in the in the space. But we basically started to talk with Jeremy about where this world should continue and where the crypto world uh, should continue and where it meets and what what i think should be done and what he thinks should be done and we kind of like realized that we could basically do this you know uh uh and so uh, it was uh, quite a quite an easy decision to to kind of hop on on working together um yeah Yep, yep. Uh, and so you, the CASA is like a key management service, right? The main vision of the company is like it's a, you have a three on five multi-sig and you control one key and you, it's sort of like an enterprise solution for $10,000 per year. So uh, that's the product. Okay, right let, me, let me jump in there uh, right. and correct a few things. 
The right. vision of the company is uh, to support uh, sovereign individuals. Okay, sovereign and secure hodlers. Uh, that's the vision. Uh, the Multisig app is one of the products. Okay, it's our first and flagship product. Uh, it basically is not just a piece of software. It's not the Multisig app itself. What, it, what we bring is a premium level of service. So it includes a software app that's, that makes it super easy for people to use Multisig. Okay. But it also includes service, uh, a 24 seven dedicated client advisory, uh, and a lot of little perks, you know, that, uh, make our customers more secure or more sovereign. And that's where the note comes into play because, you know, I said, you cannot be completely secure and sovereign, uh, if you're not running your note. So how do we make it possible for our customers that are not technical? Uh, to run their own node. So let's just build a super cool and user-friendly interface, right? To the Bitcoin full node and to the Lightning Network node because that, that's very nascent, that's very new, and it's purely command line. And a lot of people want to try, but they don't know how. So we are basically, the vision of CASA or the mission is to bridge security and sovereign or private ownership with user, user experience, with usability. So that, you know, the, the, the user is the very center of, of what we do. We have uh, the, the best designer uh, in the space. Uh, he came from completely non-crypto world. Um, you know, so he, uh, he looks at stuff and he points out, uh, that's not understandable. I don't, you know, I wouldn't get this. So he's, He's the he's basically ruling over the entire uh, Casa experience. Yeah, I think you had mentioned that he's from Tinder, right? <laughs> he was, yeah, he was uh, the the designer of Tinder, uh, yeah. where you know you you can see the the user approach, swipe left or right. 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 There's nothing more to do, and so he uh, Scott Herf is his name. He's also the author of a bestseller O'Reilly uh, edition of. Uh, designing products people love. Right. It's, it's right. The, the best sold uh, books on user design, user experience. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so you know, he uh, he's the inventor of the super like <laughs> in Tinder. That actually that was uh, the 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 component for Tinder that they were missing because they were losing money before. Then he came up with the super like, and they that shoot the company into super profit. So. Also, design thinking can, you know, create uh, create a lot of revenue. Yeah. Right, right. So the vision at Casa you have is, uh, so you have started from a, like a top tier approach. You're targeting enterprises and people like who are willing to pay three hundred dollars no. for a lightning node, right? No, no. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So the we are not targeting enterprise. Okay. We are targeting individuals first. Right. We are a Bitcoin first and sovereign hodlers first okay mm -hmm. that's our approach now our solution is also great for small funds family offices uh you know small teams any project that ever did an ico i think they should use casa mm -hmm. and not they're trying to build their own systems and not trying to use any custodian services because they don't need to okay so it is a, a great solution for that, but our focus uh, is individuals. Now right. the premium, the premium service, the key master, the you know multi sig service and and security uh, concierge, uh, costs ten thousand dollars a year. Um, now that uh, comes uh, you know with a lot of uh, perks such as a free note, uh, free hardware wallet, so a lot of a lot of things um, that that we kind of wrapping the experience. And obviously, it is not for people who uh, have uh, five thousand dollars in in crypto, right? So you need to you need to to have certain uh, certain amount to to justify uh, this purchase. Now that is like uh, the the crypto wealthy tier, right? The top tier of people who have at least I don't know uh, two hundred five hundred thousand uh, in crypto um, so to to justify this. 
w my goal is to make uh, multi-sig and all this kind of security available to to everyone gradually. Uh, that's of course the goals, but but we need to build it up uh, first. Um, so that's the thing. Then you know you can because we introduced the node as a component of the premium service. We said, okay, why not? You know, we've been building all this beautiful experience. Let's release it to to general public and see what's the response. And people got so excited about it. They say, okay, it's a proof of uh, usefulness. <laughs> if if people really demand this in uh, uh, faults that on one side are very technical, but also uh, people who don't know how to use a command line uh, came and and got the got the note mm -hmm. uh, and it's been selling really well uh, so we uh, we just are very excited about the proof of uh, concept you know that it's uh, that it's working we continue to to develop we just created a like a small uh, group for the note owners uh, to give us feedback a private group so we're working, working basically towards that. So that's the that's the current, uh, let's say, two major uh, separately to purchase products. Um, and also, we have released a security checklist or a health check, something that uh, anyone can do for. It's completely for free. Um, something people can just do in two minutes uh, for themselves and see. Uh, how good they are with their own uh, digital security uh, because a lot of like hacks uh, you know none of the mm -hmm. hacks in, in Bitcoin really happen because of some flaw in Bitcoin itself uh, the hacks are happening because uh, we are using uh, uh, vulnerable devices uh, because uh, we commit uh, some security suicides such as you know uh, posting your recovery seeds on online uh, mm. because I, I I encrypted the file and I put it on my Dropbox. It doesn't mean I'm safe, right? We uh, uh, struggle with the systemic uh, risks such as Americans, especially uh, their SIMs get transferred to or their phone numbers get transferred to new SIM card just by you know the attacker calling the, the T-Mobile or AT&T. So there's a lot of things, you know, to watch out for when you want to protect your personal data and your privacy online. And we, we want to help people finding an uh, easy way to, to see for themselves and fix the problems that they have. Yep. So, and so, um, yeah, so you are, are you planning to like, uh, launch some products that are targeted towards more normal users, like say people who have ten thousand dollars in crypto. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that's the plan. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so do, I you want tell, do you want details? I won't tell you details because okay. <laughs> it's a that's a secret sauce of uh, every company, right? And the innovation that's happening there. So, yeah. but I'll be happy to to report you, you know, in the future when we're out. <laughs> Definitely. So you are thinking, so in empowering, so you are empowered like the crypto hodlers and uh, currently, but you are thinking of empowering uh, normal users as well in the future, right? Uh, building products and multi-sig wallets and so on for them. Yes, yes, of course. Um, look, the, the note itself, I think it's quite an accessible piece of uh, piece of device um, in terms of uh, you know, a lot of people uh, that are in the space for years have always wished to have a, a node, and it's. I think it's very vital to the to the entire ecosystem that we have a huge network of nodes, right? And the node infrastructure is as as important as the mining infrastructure. Um, and this is the time when we can finally kind of made it user friendly. Uh, so CASA should be for everyone eventually. Uh, you can have a little piece of CASA at your home right now with the, with the note. Right. Uh, I, and I think there aren't many products in the market uh, and companies who are, have this focus uh, that CASA has. So I, I just want to like get, gain some insights from you. Like say, how, how do you approach uh, the marketing and reaching out to users um, and building products for them uh, uh, and building like 
Bitcoin nodes and security products? What sort of things do you keep in mind? Do you guys have like a specific plan or is it just like word of mouth that's working for you guys? Or, or you get people like Jameson Lop and Elena uh, on the team and that's it. Uh, their word is... Uh, no, that's not the plan. That's the one of the, you know, additions to the secret sauce is to have people that are uh, smart, that are experienced, that have some similar vision you know that that's that's very uh, that's very important but of course that's not the end uh we haven't for the multisig we haven't done too much of ac- actual marketing uh because we this is a very important uh, step that the key management uh needs to be done super well uh so no uh huge like you cannot uh, have people lose their money right so we wanted to make sure we we have built up the system and the processes and and uh, the software in a way that doesn't allow even casa to make uh, mistakes or be the bad actor right so we haven't done a lot of like outreach we've been quite quietly building things up However, we have uh, many paying customers already, and we are basically using like the start in quiet to 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 perfect uh, uh, all the things around the service. We are also building up the sell side, so you know we need to see uh, uh, where our clients are. But regardless of that, we have a huge wait list of of people waiting for us to get back to them. Um, without marketing <laughs> so i i see like there is a real need because people who even people who had a very advanced setup they had a multi-seek they have read the glacier protocol they have done a lot of like thinking even those people when they see the proposal of casa they they go like yeah this is just so much easier that's it it's just making it easy right uh, make it worry free. One of the things that we have um, brought into the space is getting completely rid of, uh, rid, rid away with uh, with the recovery seek. The recovery, the 24 words uh, that people have to store with their hardware wallets, that's like mission impossible for a lot of people. Um, and it is a, don't take me wrong, it is an, a, a great invention uh satoshi labs and my my uh, co-founders at trezor they were the initiators of the bip 39 yep. we we yep. sit down and we created the entire word list that helps you back up your wallet right mm-hmm. so i'm kind of proud of that <laughs> because it, it has been widely adopted throughout uh throughout the ecosystem now it's a standard mm-hmm. uh and it really allows people to like back up their stuff once at the beginning and never have to back up again right so it's it's uh, for me that was kind of a mind-blowing experience to to understand that you can do this with bitcoin you know um so we solved that but at the same time uh, it it is a very new paradigm for people to protect some words right you know uh, for, ever, is- for 10 years or- for 50 years ahead. So we, uh, Casa has built a system of a multi-seek where uh, our customers do not store uh, the, the words at all. Uh, because the way it works is basically you have a three of five uh, mm-hmm. multi-seek, which means you need three keys to move the funds. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, uh, and you have all your keys in a distributed uh in uh, distributed in several locations so uh it's very unlikely that you lose a key uh it doesn't happen that often if it happens you probably lose one and you probably do not lose two but you can still lose two with casa you still have a way to transfer money so that the way it works is just uh you you wake up at night and you realize you're you're missing your you know treasure <laughs> and uh so you uh, uh, you panic and you can just go to your CASA app uh, and uh, start the recovery process. Or let's say uh, we allow you to rotate, to do key rotation to a multi-seek, a new multi-seek 
we overnight you a new treasure uh, mm-hmm. or a ledger because we, we advise our clients to have both. Um, and you can just basically within a few seconds uh, restore the entire setup. So it's, it's really, yeah, we, we've made it really, really easy. Um, yeah, so this is, a, this is something new uh, that otherwise you don't have. If you set up your own multisig and you have, mm-hmm. you know, five different keys, then you have five keys and five uh, recovery seats. Mm-hmm. So you end up with 10 items to protect. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. That's right. actually incre- increasing your risk exposure not decreasing right. so it, it defies it defies the entire concept of a multi-seek in a way right mm-hmm. um yeah so this uh, this is basically how uh, how casa is i think outstanding so it's not just the people you know we are uh, innovating uh and we are carefully uh planning uh, uh our steps ahead so you will see more uh presence of casa of course but mm-hmm. right now we are uh, taking t- taking it slow, building up everything. So we are basically ready to provide the best service. You know, that's the goal. Right, makes sense. And uh, yeah, the contribution that you guys did to BIP thirty nine that's that's freaking awesome. And like it's like as you said, widely adopted. Like even we use it like on on a regular basis in, in some of our, our services and products. Uh, very good. Um, I have a question regarding the foundation now. Um, so, so the Bitcoin startup ecosystem is not, uh, 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 it's not uh, centralized in the place, right? So, for example, New York City is a finance hub and China is or Shanghai is the, is the manufacturing hub, right? But you see in crypto, there are like people popping up all over the place, right? You have Ricardo Spagani and his team sitting up in South Africa doing some cool stuff yeah. in Monero and Tari. There's stuff going on in Toronto, a little bit in New York City. There's a lot going on in Baltics, Russia. And there are some pockets in India and China where there's stuff happening as well, right? So my question is, uh, uh, B, so how does B Foundation um, plan to reach all of these pockets and actually send funds to entrepreneurs who are really passionate about you know, solving some of the problems that, are, that we are going to face in the crypto ecosystem over the next few years and decades? Uh, I, it's not that, you know, the, the B, um, uh, that's a, that's a, wait, let, let, let me see how to answer this. It's not that the B uh, needs to take, uh, huge steps to reach those people. Those, those people are reaching out to us. Um, we, are. Uh, that's why, you know, one of the, the ideas, by the way, uh, the, the part of the foundation is a necessary evil. Uh, we, uh, I, it was not my uh, wish to have uh, a foundation uh, because it's kind of, a, you know, um, it's an explosive uh, uh, material in Bitcoin because of uh, some experience in the past. Uh, uh, so, you know, people react uh, according to, to that. Uh, and also, you know, I... Uh, I'm not interested to create any kind of representative body of Bitcoin. Uh, the idea was to pull a few uh, people together that are smart, that have proven uh, that they have built stuff in Bitcoin in the past, that they have not uh, stolen money from anyone, you know, stuff like that, and and use their will to to offer some free time to help uh, support some some cool projects. That's the goal, right? Nothing else. So uh, uh, Giacomo is helping me with this. Uh, we want to have some uh, open uh, uh, you know, funding through GitHub uh, uh, set up. So he's, he's building that up. Uh, I'm taking care of the more boring uh, establishment, uh, documentation, stuff like that. So that's still like, in the in the process and then i hope that those people who need support uh, such as you know academics and uh, some researchers uh uh, and uh, you know developers should be a big focus as well um that they kind of find us because uh i i don't want to do um how to put i don't want to market the b that's the B is not important at all. The B is someone to just organize the stuff uh, in the background, 
uh, so there will be you will not see a huge marketing of the bee right it will be more of like okay hands down and uh, let's help uh, move a few things forward so. Um, so let's say there's a startup in some remote part of the world and they want to they are working on some cool stuff on Bitcoin and they they are looking for funding so what do you recommend they should they should uh, look at or what are the things that they should definitely put in their application so that their chances of getting accepted are, are higher um, the the exact rules are being crafted uh, still so and it, I think it's not like a fixed uh, process but the goal is to support research and development that means mainly stuff that is not existing so if a startup comes and we want to create a new wallet hell you you know you need to 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 do something innovative uh, because if it's just a fork of an existing wallet it doesn't mean it, it doesn't make any sense to support that right so uh, uh, anything that needs to be researched so so academic uh, work uh, will be supported because that's the most problematic part to find finances if you're building a startup uh, then the assumption is that you should be built your business plan to be profitable right you see the difference so one thing is like uh, actual research and the other thing is actual building of commercial businesses um, that you should probably speak to investors uh, if you need some funding uh, we could also um, um, discuss like the, the commercial involvement of, of the foundation because the good thing about the place where where we're uh, having it is uh, that uh, it's it's uh, Liechtenstein and Liechtenstein uh, is a small country that allows you to have uh, a, a mixed type of foundation, which means that the foundation can have, uh, can support charitable purposes, okay, such as research and development and, and scholarships uh, for students to learn coding on Bitcoin. Uh, that's charitable part, but it could potentially have uh, some commercial uh, stakes somewhere saying yes okay we support this and once you know when when you when you have profits uh, the profits go back to the foundation and kind of feed back the monster right the principle of of course is that none of the uh, advisors or uh, founders benefit from that it's not for for us to like benefit financially it's for the 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 ecosystem to benefit from from uh, more focused uh efforts and this is not again there are many many uh, uh things happening in the space that i'm very excited about you know bitcoin optech and like uh, a lot of educational uh efforts are happening that's exciting but these educational efforts are scattered and not scalable mm -hmm. when are they're face to face they are not accessible to people from third uh, world mm -hmm. from developing countries uh there's no way a person from even from my country uh an average person would pay for five thousand dollars for for a uh face to face with jimmy song he's doing a great job but uh, for most of the world that's a no-go like uh, you you know how much can a, a young person in india pay for a for a course right uh, it's it's not more than thousand or fifteen hundred dollars and that's and that's a lot because right. uh, fifteen hundred dollars in some like Ukraine that's several months of a salary. Right, right. Yeah, even in India, right. if you take the average salary. Right, 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 right. Right. What's the average salary in India? I think it's like twelve hundred dollars a year or something. Right. What? Like twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars a year. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I, so you see, yeah. you see. Well, you see, that's that's my point. So, uh, what I would like to do, uh, and I'm already starting to like discuss and and, and project this out, is a uh, an online workshop mm -hmm. for developers that know to code. Okay, they're not new to coding, but they know to code. But you know, mm -hmm. coding on Bitcoin is kind of uh, difficult still. Mm -hmm. right. So, just helping them 
getting the first touch, getting the first understanding of Bitcoin, finding where to go to resources, having people to, to talk to, you know, just kind of like supporting this and making it accessible for a very reasonable price mm -hmm. and not for free, uh, right? <laughs> because whatever right. is for free has no value. And I also want to uh, kind of, you know, uh, find a way how to incentivize everyone. So the teachers, you know, uh, the people to actually participate. I have paid a few dollars for this. I really want to, to follow, you know, follow the workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, so have this in a very scalable manner and then people will just decide, oh, I want to do backend, uh, uh, I want to run the infrastructure for Bitcoin or I want to go into developing applications or mm -hmm. doing uh, code reviews and that's very important, especially mm -hmm. in the core development, right? So uh, anything uh, will can come from, from uh, and this is just like a small uh, activity that we can do, we can have a a place to go for people to learn about mm -hmm. Bitcoin coding online. Mm -hmm. Right. I would right. love to work then with uh, with uh, people around the world to help us translate into you know uh, other languages. Right. Uh, so we are kind of like uh, scalable also in in other parts of the world. I'm kind of like focused uh, to 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 helping um, to bring people from outside of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, towards Bitcoin, and that means developers, maybe uh, you know people that have heard very negative stuff about Bitcoin and are kind of like scared to try, so try to like change their minds. Right, and I think that the interest is already there. We did like a um, introduction to Bitcoin and principles of cryptography workshop. In, in our city and it's like a small city and like 50 or 70 people showed up. So, so nice. there are people who are interested. It's just like there aren't enough good avenues who like explain things from scratch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as you said, like getting into Bitcoin is not, it's not like traditional programming, right? It's not Python where you just jump in and start coding. Right. And that's, and we are talking about developers. You assume that a developer, he knows GitHub, he knows how, you know, he knows to research online. Uh, there's a lot of people who could get into Bitcoin with other skills. You know, we, we still need, we, unfortunately, we do need lawyers. We do need lawyers. We need accounts that understand crypto in your local environment. We need, you know, marketers. We need business developers, uh, operations, and all, all these. These people also need to understand crypto. Uh, for me, I was very lucky because I, when I was researching for my thesis, I only, you know, I stayed at the, at the very su superficial level back in like 2010, 11. I didn't understand how Bitcoin works. Right, right. What, what actually uh, constitutes its security. And only thanks to the, the lucky event of me, uh, you know, joining forces with Slash and Stick for Trezor, I learned a big deal, but I was lucky to have them. Mm -hmm. sitting next to me right so i could ask the questions but this is not scalable right so <laughs> we need to see how how to make it right so possible. yep so what sort of timelines are you looking for for b foundation like do you have some projects or some uh, things that you are unveiling yeah what sort of timeline is that and yeah the timeline is uh, uh we said we want to make, uh, we want to prepare the foundation uh, to be fully operational, to be uh, established all, uh, all the legal documents, all the internal processes and everything by the end of this year. Uh, we announced uh, in Riga, that's uh, when you may be confused because uh, in Riga we announced uh, the B and uh, one week later uh, in Palm Springs, I was announcing CASA. Right. Uh, but uh, we announced uh, this prior to uh, go fully going forward so we can get feedback and people uh, approaching us and you know saying hey i want to help uh do you want to do you want money do you want people you know so and this is happening right now so i'm in parallel having some initial discussions about you know who to work with or not not 
especially like who, but what to what to work on and and gather all the people that want to help in a way. Um, I spend uh, some time, uh, like two two months of traveling right now, so I'm finally back to Prague. Uh, so to, and and able to actually move forward with some of the establishing stuff so that's that's basically it for this year and from next year uh we want to start actually cranking some projects uh launching the the, the site for projects and donation workflow everything okay okay yeah um and like what sort of funding model do you have like uh who are the people who are funding the b foundation so there, you know, some of the people have been in the space for a long time, and they just want to uh, pay back for being fortunate enough uh, to 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 be in the space for some time. Uh, some of the people that are contributing are companies who want, always wanted to support, for example, Bitcoin or or Lightning Network, but they didn't know where to go. Um, it's like you know you have a company and you you wish to you you would totally benefit from a, a fully developed lightning network right so you have let's say uh, I know a 50k or 100k that you want to give to support this but you don't know where to go how to pick a company which company which project so it's easier to to kind of trust uh, an assembly of experts that they will kind of like try to make, at least try to make good decisions, you know, <laughs> about uh, what, what to support. So that, that's, that's basically, um, I'm, I'm not planning on, I'm not envisioning any membership or anything like that uh, as, uh, as some, some other foundations do have. Uh, I don't want to actually deal with that. Uh, but what we will make possible is something very different uh, from other foundations. Uh, you will be able to specifically pick a project that you want to support. And that by project, I mean uh, not a company, but a, a, a goal, right? So let's say uh, someone says we need uh, some uh, API that would call something, you know, and it, we need it as open source tool, so it's available for all merchants, for example, right? So that's kind of a thing, yeah, we can, uh, anyone basically will be able to open a pull request for a specific project. And uh, the, the assembly of, uh, of advisors will say, yes, this is something that is not existing and it is needed and it's kind of viable and we will open the, the project for funding online. So if you want, you can come and say, look, guys, here is money, uh, take it as the B and decide you know, what's needed to be financed. Or you can come and say, oh no, I want to support specifically this thing. So that's kind of a new. Right, approach. right. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, th I think we have covered quite a lot, Alina. We talked about Casa, Treasure, yes. B Foundation. Um, and I, I really wish you the best for both Casa and Bitcoin Foundation and some other cool projects that you come up as well Thank in you. the future. Yep. All right. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Have a nice day yeah. or night nice. in India. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.